When we left off at the end of our last episode, October 28th, 1918, the Czechoslovak National Committee had just taken control over the Great Bohemian Basin, the plains of Moravia, and western parts of Slovakia after a declaration by their patrons abroad, Tomáš Masaryk and Edvard Beneš. As the citizens of Prague celebrated their newfound independence, Masaryk was still returning from Russia as we mentioned in the last episode. Meanwhile, Benes had been in America before going to the Paris Peace Conference, and we'll catch back up with both of these figures later on. Also helping to carve out the Czechoslovak state was the Slovak Specific National Committee based in Martin. Maciusz Dula proclaimed secession on the 30th of October, while Slovak Milan Radislav Stefanik was with Masaryk in Russia at the time and would come to represent the Slovaks once the two returned and Masaryk was leading the government. Meanwhile, in Agram, the main city of Croatia, Slavonia, the Ban of Croatia, Anton Mihailovic, left for the city of Vienna after a summons from Emperor Karl. Upon his arrival in the imperial capital the next day, the Habsburg Emperor told him regarding the independence of Croatia, Do as you please. The same day, the National Council of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs in Agram declared independence. The council's chairman, Anton Koroshets, a Catholic priest from Styria, became president of the State of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, based in Agram, which is now renamed Zagreb in the Serbo-Croatian language. Thousands of Slavs celebrated in the streets of Zagreb in complete celebration and jubilation at their independence from the Habsburg monarchy. Independence wasn't the only thing Kaiser Karl granted the Croatians. He also left them some of Austria-Hungary's Adriatic fleet, a portion which included the flagship SMS Virabis Unitis. The ship was transferred to the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs the same day, October 29th, and was renamed the Yugoslavia, which was the name of the joint state the Croats and Serbs had agreed to create in the Corfu Declaration. Thus, this ship was eventually expected to be a Yugoslav ship. Yugoslavia just meaning South Slavia, the Southern Slavs being the designation for Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs, as well as Montenegrins. Kaiser Karl also released Bosnia-Herzegovina from its obligations to the Empire. However, a limited number of Austrian troops remained in the area, preventing this from happening immediately, but Sarajevo announced its intent to join with Zagreb. Over in northeast Italy, the Habsburg forces were in retreat as the Italians advanced from the west and south towards Vittorio. In Hungary, the liquidation government recognized the Count Mikhaili Karolyi as its de facto leader, while Count Istvan Tisa, Hungarian prime minister during the war and seen as part of the pro-war faction, was murdered in his home by the so-called Aster revolutionaries. Tisa had three assassination attempts on his life previously and had recently revealed his pre-war opposition to Austria's invasion of Serbia, which were his first public statements against the war. However, it was not enough to save him from the revolutionaries, who reportedly were disgruntled soldiers. The next day, October 31st, 1918, the Hungarian parliament officially voted to nullify the Augs the Austrian-Hungarian Compromise of 1867. With its annulment, the monarchy of the Kingdom of Hungary was not officially abolished, nor was Charles of Habsburg officially removed yet, but the intent to move away from him was signed into law with the abolition of the personal union between Austria and Hungary. This made Hungary an independent country, still technically with a Habsburg as king, but here in its getaway phase, the Hungarians were clearly moving in their own direction and saw the Habsburgs as an instrument of Austrian domination, or more accurately, accurately the domination of German speakers within the empire. The same day, Karol Yi was named the Prime Minister and Acting President. Meanwhile, the Serbs and their French allies had surrounded Austrian-Hungarian forces in Belgrade, and the Serbs were on the verge of retaking their capital. The Serbs advanced north against the few Habsburg troops still defending the city, most of whom no longer even had a contiguous path back to their homeland. On November 1st, 1918, the Serbs retook Belgrade. The first objective of the war from the Austrians was now one of the last for the Serbs and the French, and jubilant Serbian civilians 
civilians filled the streets. Now that the city was liberated, just a handful of Habsburg troops remained in either Bosnia or Serbia, and those that were were quickly on the retreat. Meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, an agreement to join with Zagreb was put forth by the forces that had taken power in Sarajevo while the Austrian-Hungarians evacuated. Also on November 1st, some of the other German-speaking locals, the Danube Swabians, along with liberal Hungarian speakers, set up the multi-ethnic, socialist-leaning Banat Republic. This republic, however, based out of Temeswar, today's Timisoara, Romania, was extremely unpopular with both Serbs in its western third and the Romanians in its eastern third. These populations continuously agitated to join each respective country. However, for now, the Banat Republic would survive, led by German-speaking Hungarian Otto Roth and former Hungarian Minister of War Albert Bartha, who was helping the Republic operate on behalf of Hungarian interests. Meanwhile, the Duchy of Bukovina, with its capital at Chernovitz, became de facto independent on November 1st as Hungarian troops and the Austrian governor withdrew from the territory, which had been part of the lands of the Imperial Council. Now it was claimed by Romania and the Western Ukrainians that had just set up shop in Lviv that we're about to talk about. The locals, however, compromised under Aral Onshul, who was an ethnic Romanian but did negotiate with the Ukrainian delegation. His biggest opponent was actually a Romanian, Yanku Flandor who advocated for the Duchy of Bukovina's full accession to the Kingdom of Romania. In Lemberg, longtime local Ukrainian leader Kost Levitsky led the local delegation of Ukrainians and Ruthenians, or Rus, from the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy and its Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria. Levitsky's group seized control of the eastern part of Galicia, an area which included lots of Polish inhabitants as well, which they fiercely opposed. Levitsky proclaimed the West Ukrainian People's Republic on November 1st in Lemberg, the city of course being known in Ukrainian as Lviv. This West Ukrainian government of Levitsky was unrelated to the Kiev-based government, the so-called Hetman Tate, under the Ukrainian Hetman Pavlo Skoropadsky, and was carved out of the Ukrainian lands that had previously belonged to the Russian Empire. Meanwhile, Levitsky's government did not have backing from any foreign powers, and of course it was carved out of Ukrainian territory that had been part of the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy. Both Ukrainian governments were opposed by the local Polish population and by the members of the still coming together Polish governments. The Polish population was also heavily present in Western Galicia and other areas to the West, remaining under Austrian feudal or military control, with the Poles being just one of several populations with a significant presence in these areas. The areas around Western Galicia and Southeastern Silesia, along with the Sudetenland and other nearby territories, were home to Germans, Poles, Czechs, Slovaks, and Rus. Although landed aristocrats remained in control of these areas due to the presence of the Austrian army, the future of the territories was hotly contested amongst locals and the surrounding states. Meanwhile, in the Adriatic, the newly christened ship Yugoslavia was sitting in port at Pula. Now, Pula and the rest of Istria were still under Austrian feudal control at this point, and the Italians, which had not recognized the Zagreb government, sent soldier and engineer Raffaele Rossetti and a partner to Pula to take care of the situation. Situation. Rossetti had invented a manned torpedo. Now, the object here wasn't to ram the torpedo into the side of the boat and blow it up, it rather was a transport for Rossetti to get to Pula in secret and sneak aboard the Yugoslavia's hold. Rossetti was caught while planting the TNT on board, which he later admitted to the Croatian officers who apprehended him. The ship's 300 occupants were evacuated while the ship was swept for the potential TNT. However, the Croatian strike force did not find the explosives, and the team gave the ship the all-clear. Once over 250 sailors had returned to the vessel, it finally and tragically blew up sinking and killing nearly 300 Slovene, Croat, Serb, and Bosniak sailors. Despite the possible mistaken identity, the Italian governments had no regrets about the raid on Pula. Rossetti and his partner were awarded the Italian gold medal for military valor, and the Italian government did not apologize for the raid, despite the fact that it had killed Janko Vukovic, the newly minted Croat naval commander who had gone down with the ship. 
Going into the next day, the Italians, who had already taken Vittorio, continued their offensive into Venetia, while the Serbs and the French continued to advance from Belgrade. Despite Hungary's separation from the dual monarchy, its forces were still at war with Italy. However, with the situation now dire, Karol Yi ordered that his troops pull out, and they joined the Czechs, Slovaks, Poles, Ukrainians, Ruthenians, and other nationalities that were leaving the front as the Royal Hungarian part of the Imperial and Royal Army marched home. By the next day, Serbia had finally recaptured its pre-war territory, while in the east, the Serbian-Bulgarian border was reset to where it was in 1914 as British troops began to march across the now-surrendered Bulgaria on their way to the Ottoman Empire. By this point, Sarajevo also joined with Zagreb. However, the most momentous event on this day was the armistice at Villa Giusti, in which the German-speaking Austrians, who were the only ones left at the front, surrendered to the Italians forcing them to evacuate from Veneto and requiring the Austrians to also surrender longtime possessions such as South Tyrol and Trieste. The Austrians also did not effectively communicate their surrender, allowing the Italians to surround and capture over 100,000 Austrian prisoners in the days following the surrender. By the end of the day, the Italians were arriving to claim Trieste, as their forces clambered out of boats and were greeted by the Italian-speaking population. However, this incensed the South Slavs, especially Croats and Slovenes. However, it would not be the last of Italy's extensive territorial claims along the Adriatic coast. They also laid claim to Zadar, which they called Zara, and the Italians raised their flag over Zara by the end of the day on November 3rd. Meanwhile, in western Galicia, in the town of Vislik Veliki, local Ruthenians declared an Eastern Lemko Republic based in Kamansha. This republic did intend to unite with the neighboring West Ukrainian People's Republic based in Lviv, but neither administration was yet strong enough to link up. Two days later, a similar uprising occurred north of there in Tarnobzheg, where local Polish socialist and communist uprisers attempted to form a republic. However, little evidence exists to suggest that this administration extended beyond the center of the town. It was a moot point because also on the 6th, workers' councils from both the general government of Lublin and western Galicia came together in the city of Lublin to form a government which would begin operating the next day, an independent Polish state. Also on the 6th, the Italians continued to expand their claims in both Istria and Dalmatia. With Zara and Surrounds already in hand, they pushed further into Dalmatia while also beginning to occupy Istria beyond just Trieste. With the formation of the independent Polish People's Republic out of the combined lands of Lublin and Western Galicia, the Polish National Committee nominated socialist Ignacy Dzinski as Premier of Poland on a temporary basis until Józef Pilsudski, the de facto leader of the Polish nation, was released from German imprisonment. The Germans, of course, were still fighting the Great War and were still backing the puppet Polish regime out of Warsaw. Three days later, the Italians resumed their advance in Istria. Also on November 9th, 1918, the German Emperor Wilhelm II, after being advised to abdicate, fled to the Netherlands. Despite the fact that the emperor did not officially abdicate, his regional princes and kings did, with populist governments forming throughout Germany in their places. Although it hadn't been the official name, the German realm had been commonly known as the Kaiserreich since 1871, the imperial realm. But now, without the monarchy, the official name of German realm became succinct. The state was not disbanded, with the realm that now dated continuously back to 1871 continuing on as a republic simply without its monarch. Not only did the German state continue, but the war continued for the moment as well. However, the next day, the German Council of People's Deputies an acting head of state with the powers of the monarch over the Reichstag, took power in the country and began armistice negotiations with the Allies. The future stab-in-the-back theory that socialist politicians had sold out a victorious German army to end the war began right here as this council took power specifically for the purpose of signing an armistice. The council also made a de facto flag change as the red-black-yellow tricolor from the 1848 revolutions began to fly atop the Reichstag dog in Berlin. The Croats and Slovenes advanced into the eastern part of Istria, for the moment forming a straight-line frontier with the Italians. However, the disputes between the Croats and the Italians remained numerous. 
Also on this day, the Western powers encouraged Romania, which had been on the Allied side but was forced to sign an armistice and had been exploited for resources by the Central Powers, declared war and re-entered the conflict, fighting against Hungary and Bulgaria. The French, who of course were based in Serbia, were supporters of this, and the Allies had also guaranteed Romania and other countries portions of the Kingdom of Hungary if they would join the Allied cause. The Romanians had been promised Transylvania and they began their advance from the northwest with the intent of advancing to the line that had been promised to them to which the Hungarians would also eventually be ordered to retreat. The Italians didn't only annex southern Tyrol, they also sent troops to occupy northern Tyrol including Innsbruck. This was done under the terms of the Italian-Austrian armistice, and this was done under Austria's jurisdiction and with Austrian troops also in the area. With this advance, the Italians became the first member of the Entente in World War I to reach the German border as the Italians deployed their lines along the southern edge of Bavaria. Over in the northern portions of Bukovina, the majority Ukrainian population rose up and attempted to take over civil control. They had the quiet support of Aurel Ansul, the de facto leader of Bukovina, which would enrage his fellow local Romanians, and rival Yanku Flandor would influence the decision by Romania to send a division of troops under Jakub Zadik to secure the region, and to two days later assist in setting up a new cabinet of Bukovina led by Flandor. Also on November November 10th, Josef Pilsudski, the Polish leader in exile who'd been imprisoned in Magdeburg the previous year for not swearing loyalty to the Germans and Austrians, was finally released from prison and returned to Warsaw. The movement of Pilsudski was allowed by the German Council of People's Deputies in Berlin, and the German army in Poland had already given civilian control back to the Polish authorities while now being on the verge of dissolving their military government in Warsaw. The next day would become one of the more famous dates in the 20th century. November 11th, 1918. The German military, with the approval of the German Council of People's Deputies in Berlin, signed the armistice with the Allies at 11 a.m., bringing an end to the First World War, but not to the fighting, especially in the region we're looking at. It's easy to get lost in all the border changes, especially in the wake of a collapse like this, but it's important to remember that every time one of these lines on a map changes, it most of the time came with immense human suffering, and in this region, Region, those changes in that suffering would persist for some time. Now that the Germans had finally withdrawn from Warsaw and Poland gained its independence with Pilsudski as its commander-in-chief, the Polish Regency Council, which had been running civil affairs in the Warsaw administration since October 23rd, now became the de facto government, forming a second independent Polish state. However, Dosinski, leader of the Polish People's Republic, had already agreed that he would eventually be merging his government into Pilsudski. You'll notice that we've been talking a lot about the minorities of Austria-Hungary in this episode and not very much about the German-speaking Austrians. However, we're going to go much more in-depth into Austria in the next episode when we preview its almost Anschluss with Germany. The economic situation in Austria at this point was dire and socialists had taken control of the legislature, the Imperial Council. Due to the ongoing developments, Emperor Karl would renounce his political power and all participation in state affairs. He would also move out of the Imperial Palace and into a separate villa, while the Imperial Council was transformed into the State Council, and Socialist Karl Renner was named as its first Chancellor. With the transformation from the Imperial Council to the State Council, Renner's government officially transformed the Austrian monarchy into a republic, the Republic of German Austria. Austria. Despite the dismantling of feudal control, the agrarian economic interests kept Austria in power in the Sudetenland and the German majority areas of Bohemia, even following the end of direct feudal control. As mentioned in a previous episode, there was a significant Czech minority in these areas, and as we'll discuss in the next episode when we talk more about Austria's economics, many of the German-speaking businessmen of the region actually saw a much more secure future in Czechoslovakia than they did in the Republic of Germany. In Austria. Other things we saw on the 11th into the 12th, the Romanians would continue their advance west into Transylvania, while the Serbs would push northward and clash with the German and Hungarian leaders in the Banat. If you're wondering where exactly this Romanian advance is headed, or the Serbian one for that matter, it was all up to the major Entente power in the region, France. On November 13th, the French forced the Hungarians to sign the Belgrade Military Arrangements, officially setting out a line of demarcation 
location for the Hungarian troops to retreat to as part of a deal to avoid further losses in battle. Also on the 13th, the Serbs continued their advance north into the Banat. They reorganized the captured territories outside of the Kingdom of Serbia proper as the Great National Assembly of the Banat, Bachka, and Baranja, with its capital in Novi Sad and the Serbian military intent on expanding north and west. The assembly was mainly comprised of the Vojvodina Serbs from the west of the Banat, along with the territories just northwest of Novi Sad, Bachka, and Baranja. However, the Serbs' primary military goal was to eliminate the Hungarian-backed Banat Republic. In the Kingdom of Hungary itself, King Charles, the translated Hungarian title of the former Emperor Karl, renounced any remaining political affiliation from the Kingdom of Hungary and renounced his participation from state affairs. Like in Austria, the Emperor never officially abdicated, instead declaring these intentions in the Akartsaw Proclamation. Karl left the region for now, but would retain contacts on the ground and continue to look for an opening to regain the throne of either Austria or Hungary. Hungary Hungary became a de facto regency, a kingdom without a king. The regency kingdom to the north in Poland, now under the control of Pilsudski, abolished its monarchy while absorbing the Polish People's Republic. The kingdom and its regency were eliminated, and the head of state was changed from the regency council to Pilsudski himself, although technically on an interim basis still at this point. The new Poland would be a republic with Pilsudski as its chief of state. Meanwhile, in the Romanian-occupied areas of Transylvania, the Central National Romanian Council declared elections, open only to ethnic Romanians, to the Romanian National Assembly of Transylvania and Hungary, an independent body representing Romanian speakers in the occupied areas. The Serbs continued their advance north and back towards the east, attempting to eliminate all German and Hungarian influence in the Banat. On the 14th, Masaryk officially became the president of Czechoslovakia. Masaryk was still abroad at the time, at this point in New York. On the 15th, the Serbs finally eliminated the Banat Republic, expanding their client state to the north, while the Romanian advance allowed for the expansion of their client in Transylvania to the west. On the 16th, the advance from the Romanians would continue from the southeast. Meanwhile, in Hungary, the government of the Count Mihaili Karolyi declared the official abolition of the monarchy, overthrowing the feudal order in Hungary and proclaiming the Hungarian Hungarian People's Republic, with a government led by Social Democrats. At this point, Hungary still had many of its pre-war resources in much of its territory, which were gravely in question, given Hungary's position surrounded by enemies, especially the Romanians who continued to advance, and the Serbs who had stopped their marching for now, but had designs on the southwest portions of Hungary for a potential future Yugoslavia, including Bachka and Baranja, both of which were openly claimed by the Serb clients in Novi Sad. So as Karol Yi's new state came into existence on November 16th, it was immediately thrown into a difficult and threatening situation. So a lot has changed over the course of the 19 days of this episode. Imagine living this. Both triumph and tragedy were everywhere. We didn't, of course, talk too much about Austria itself in this episode. And as I mentioned earlier, that's because the next time we're going to dive deeper into the German-Austrian economy, its relationship with Czechoslovakia, its potential Anschluss with Germany, and its ongoing social and political upheaval, we'll also see the culmination of Serbia's efforts throughout this period and the continuation of Hungary's decline. That's all right here on our next episode of The Collapse of Austria-Hungary and the Almost Anschluss. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, and Patreon. And again, thank you so much for checking out the content. See you next time.